OK. Now, what I'm going to do is look at the case study projects. And I use a numbering system here. So a project can go multiple taxation years. A project's not going to finish just because you have a taxation year. A project's not going to finish until you, you know, discover the answer or you give up. So it may extend two, three, four taxation years. But what you have to submit each year to the Canada Revenue Agency with your tax return has to be focused on a specific taxation year. So again, what happens is the, the square and the triangle, what I call the objectives and the uncertainties, they can be the same from year to year. It continues on. The objectives usually should not change at all. In fact, if you change the objectives, they may say you change the project. But one of the key things that the form asks, is this, this a, is this the first year of your project? Or is this a project that we already accepted last year? Because if they already accepted it last year, chances are they're not going to review it. Or they're not going to review it in the same detail. They're just going to go right to the activities. Because they're going to say, if we accepted it last year, we were happy with the objectives. We were happy with the uncertainties. Or we wouldn't have accepted it last year. Let's just make sure that the activities are still in line with the uncertainties and we're not in the commercial phase. That's really it. So it goes through maybe one third the level of review of a new project. If something's a new project, it's going to go score track. They're going to go all the way through it. Okay? It might be a desk review, or it might be an on-site review. Um, if you do a good enough job, hopefully it's a desk review, but it, it will be reviewed. It will be reviewed in what they call downstream, but someone will still read it and decide why it's in or out in, in every case. Okay? So what I like to do is recommend a numbering scheme where I know <laughs> what are the new projects, what are the older projects, and how long has this project been open? Because three years seems to be the cutoff point that they want you to be very specific why a project should be more than three years. You know? If it's, uh, I'm building a nuclear plant, it's going to take 15 years. Well, OK, that's fine. But it's got to be something specific like that. All right, so project 1401, to me, is the first project that I started in the 2014, in the last fiscal year, because I'm claiming 2015 now. So I know that project is a continuation project, and it's been and I've done it for one year. Projects 1500 to 1502 are all new ones that I started in this year. Okay? So again, that's just a numbering scheme I recommend. You don't, you don't have to do that. But something to help you keep that in mind is important when you're filling out the form. So what we've done here, I realize it's kind of small, is I've shown you a cost overview. This is what we call the direct cost summary. And we've allocated cost to each of those uh, projects, the miniature printer, the engineering case, the software uh, technology guidelines, and the software tax case. And these are basically the costs that you would end up claiming on, on the SRD return. There's costs for employee wages. We'll talk about specified and non-specified employees. There's costs for contractors. And there's costs for materials. There used to be costs for other things like capital equipment. Uh, that's been phased out after 2014. And uh, then there's other allocations that we can make based on wages or other reasonable methods for overhead. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. So going into the miniature printer case now in a little bit more detail, the company had filed claims uh, for its prior taxation year. Um, so this is, a, this is a typical of the company's successful claims. All of a sudden, they've been getting everything for five or six years. And all of a sudden, around 28 to 2011, we started seeing these denials, and they picked up around 2012. Um, so they said, after commercial release, it investigated complaints. So it did a 200 printer release to the market. And this was part of their problem. The government said, oh, you did a 200 printer release. You're in commercial production. There couldn't be any SR&D, &E right? And they found that really this was, they argued this was more like a prototype, a, a beta, alpha or beta test. It wasn't full commercial. That 50 of them came back with major problems, performance issues, at which point they said, oh, this is an SR&D &E project, right? Um, so they ran their, their SRNDD project. So the CRA took the position that it's commercial production. Because you sold it, there could be no uncertainty. Right? I always love that argument that often they put on blinders, uh, <clears throat> saying, oh, no, if, if you sold it, if someone's paying for it, there could be no uncertainty. I, I, I always like to say, well, you mean if someone hired me to build them a time machine, there wouldn't be any uncertainty because they paid me for it? Of course, we all laugh because that's ridiculous. But uh, they still don't go back from their original assertion. Um, so just taking a look at the claimant. So remember, we say we've got to be qualified personnel. So Mr. Tully is the CEO of this company. He's got a Bachelor of Science from University of Alberta in Computer Engineering. So you know, academically, he'd seem to be qualified. He holds approximately 100 different patents. 
So he's clearly got some skill at inventing and, and pushing prior art. Um, he's not normally the kind of person that would be a, attacked until recently. Right? Um, his prior art, before developing this printer, he developed and patented printers, clutches, components of printers, all of which, the fact that he got a patent means he probably was advancing the art, is kind of the definition of what is patentable. The CRA's reviewer, Mr. Wersbicka, PhD in electrical engineering. So you get a lot of these guys that come in with PhDs in something or other, some theoretical science, and they've got blinders on that, you know, everything with enough time could be, could be discovered, so nothing could really be S, R, and D. And this is, again, very upsetting. Um, so he, he got it from a PhD from University of uh, Technology in Warsaw, Poland, came to Canada in 1980, celebrated 20 years of Canadian companies in high-tech high industry. Um, he'd actually been on a team where he developed a photo plotter. So very similar technology. So he was intimately familiar with the technology that was being developed. So to show you that uh, how senior this person was, he was not uh, only an RTA, he was actually the leader of the RTAs. He, he was actually promoted to the National Technology, which is the, the specialist at CRA who trained all the other RTAs. So if, if I'm saying, well, where do the problems that we're seeing now come from, and I read back cases like this, I can start to see the, the seeds, the roots of these things taking place. Like, where did this position come from that with enough time or money, you can discover anything, so there is, nothing could be s r d Okay, which is, again, a, a very tough argument because the claimant has to go to court. So he basically said that um, he attempted the functionality accomplished in 28 and released the printer. So he said the fact that it didn't work, uh, if you sold it, there can be no more S, R, and E, D. That's it. The scientific problem starts the moment that you sell something, which is kind of ridiculous. Those are independent events. The fact that I sold something does not mean that I've answered uh, a scientific question or not. The fact that I make a conclusion and, and appear to make a, a judgment on that would be, would be the evidence in, in most people. And in, luckily, in the judge's view, too, that, that was the case, right? So the question here, really the issue is, when's commercial production? Is it when we sell it, or is it when we conclude why something's working? Um, so the judge basically co made several comments. That number one, uh, Mr. Tooley was not only an expert, he was one of the number one experts in the world. Right? So he's not understanding, why, you, why am I even here in this courtroom? Okay? He clearly stated that the uncertainties existed in 2008 and 2009, and he was specific about what those uncertainties were, as we went through on the key criteria summary. Um, he showed that there was no existing procedures available, and if they had been, he, he would have already had it functioning. Like The thing did not work, and that was undeniable. In the judge's view, the expert witness at the CRA put too much emphasis on the commercial release. The idea that if you sold it, all the scientific problems, if someone pays you, all scientific problems are released. If you were to give me money for, to cure for cancer, by their definition, cancer is solved, it's cured. But we all, we all know that's not the case. Okay? During cross-examination, he even admitted if he hadn't commercially released it, he wouldn't have given him the claim. So again, what we have here is a case of a, a science reviewer using financial issues to deny a claim and actually forcing it to go to court. And not only a, an RTA, one of the most senior RTAs, the ones who are directing everyone else on how to do this. Again, so if we, want, if we want to understand how could there be problems in the current system in Canada, not, not in other countries, but in Canada, I'm saying some of, some of these things are obvious the, the more you do these. Right? So some of the lessons here, uh, integrate more of a prior art search perhaps, things like that. It, but uh, again, this was a case where um, if you get the wrong reviewer, you could probably end up with a bad decision. And in my experience, the, the denial of a claim is more dependent on the individual who's assigned to your case at the CRA than the science of the claim anymore. And that's, that's a real problem that needs, needs to be addressed. But ultimately, your ultimate defense is document everything properly. If you've documented everything properly, you ultimately have the right to go to tax court. And though it may take time, um, we'll talk about some of the strategies where you can do it without spending a lot of money, where you can represent yourself through the informal appeal process and, and still get judgments. Okay? 
Okay. So we talked about the case of Mr. Tully and, and the miniature printer and why that was in. Northwest hydraulics. So the objective here was to improve existing hydraulic models. Some of the objectives they had were reducing bed load, downstream scouring, reducing cost, as we mentioned. The variables aimed at, at issues on geometry for upstream, dikes, spurs, alignment and shape for the intakes, sluiceways, head gates, ejectors, settling basin geometry. They go in, in a fair amount of detail, and this is just some of them, uh, about what all the variables were and some of the conclusions. It's very technical. Um, again, at, at, at the end of the day, you know, there's probably seven different major activities here. The judge concluded that this, in fact, in fact, this project was exemplary of an SRNED project. This is something I call a key criteria summary, or one of the formats that I use, to just show you, again, how many searches did they do, where were the objectives, key variables, and then, you know, did the cost look reasonable? This is a more detailed view than, than the normal summary that I give. But what I like to do is look in a little snapshot here of, do we have enough benchmarks? Do we have objectives? Are the variables technical? And does the work look and cost look like it correlates with those? And if you can see that, then you're probably OK. Software guidelines from the OECD. So again, the Canada Revenue Agency actually had a series of software projects, about six of them, uh, that they released. But then they erased them back in, in 2012. So I, I used to use those as my guidelines. And, and now I've used more tax court cases or, or whatnot. But uh, sadly, the tax court cases don't get a lot into the specifics, particularly the software ones that have been done in Canada recently. So again, the OECD, OECD guidelines are, are a useful tool, I've found. Um, so what they talk about, they don't get into the specifics of how to, how to dissect or, or document a project, but they give ideas on things that are typically eligible and things that are typically ineligible. And like I say, that, that tends to be in line with uh, the former process that the CRA used for doing that. So they talk about uh, R&D that produces new theorems and algorithms in theoretical computers. So the more theoretical, the better. Um, development of uh, operating systems level type stuff. So anything where you're dealing with an operating system, I'm you know, improving Windows or Linux or whatever, great. Um, development of actual languages, communication software, and, and related tools. This one is kind of vague, development of internet technology. So again, I don't, I don't necessarily know what that means. Um, if that's applicable as much now as it was then. It's more the methods, the method to do something. Develop, deploy, maintain software. So if I say, well, I got 12 different systems, I want to do a, a generic method to control all of them. That is the type of thing that's usually accepted as eligible. Um, so generic approaches for stuff. Um, defining technology gaps. So again, that's specific. You know, in the case of Axis, they were in Belize and they had very specific issues on the infrastructure and whatnot and timeouts and delays and how to, how to deal with stuff. Okay? And specialized areas of computing, things like vision, artificial intelligence, they, they list a whole bunch of them. So certain, certain types of areas like that are in. I would say one of the other ones uh, for, for our purposes is whenever you're developing hardware, where the hardware has some uncertainty, all of the software to run it is usually necessary to test the hardware, so it's automatically all in. You don't have to have any uncertainty on the, hard, uh, on the software development itself. Okay. Typically, ineligible activities, um, things related to business application software, supporting of existing systems, things that don't involve the uncertainty. Translation or conversion of programs from one form to another, um, adding user functions. So that's a classic one that the CRA has a problem with, that a lot of people say, well, our advancement is we added all these new features and functions. And that in itself may create technological uncertainty, but that's really not an advancement itself. That may be a business advancement, but that's not a technological advancement. You, know, you want to talk about, we're doing it faster, we're using less RAM, uh, we're using the memory, ca you know, the cache somewhere to, to get response better, or ref some kind of measurables to get improved measurable performance. Okay? Debugging, adaption, and preparing user documents. So most of those things are, are pretty self-explanatory. OK, the last of the cases that we'll be discussing is a company called Axis, Employee Health Records. So it's a Canadian company, got a contract to do a, a, a health system in Belize, in Central America. And because of the infrastructure, 
they had uh, all kinds of problems. How do, I do a, how do I get concurrent transactions going? What if something's offline? Do I go ahead? Do I make assumptions? Do I roll it back? Do I wait? Do, uh, there's, lots of, there's lots of issues on distributed transactions and how that can be a, a problem. OK. Um, so basically, they, they, they talked about some of their key uncertainties were um, really on the replication systems, right? Do I replicate data? Do I copy data? Do I uh, make assumptions of what data would be if it's not there, if I can't get online when I'm trying to do it? And basically, they said that we want to have uh, different nodes to understand the connectivity and take different methods you know, when they're queued up and they're waiting for data so that they can make transactions go ahead. So they had to formulate methods to transport the data, to pre preserve changes, to reach a high level, lower level, how will that affect uh, response times and query rates? Do they, do they have a single database? Do they distribute across multiple databases? If so how do you distribute it? Right? Which locations? And how do you deal with the interruptions? So again, the, the case doesn't get into all the details of what they've done, but they ultimately win. So they say that, number one, the judge said, the client did due diligence and looked for off-the-shelf replication software methods and could not find any. And this was, in the judge's opinion, critical, that they did do the due diligence. They didn't just jump in there and start doing it. Okay? Whereas before, you might have been, even been able to say, I'm a world leader in this. I just jumped in and did it. I'd say in the last three or four years, uh, no, you really got to do that due diligence work. Right? Um, so they want to create technology, maintain the infrastructure. Okay? I'm saying the fact that it doesn't get into a lot of details about what they did doesn't, doesn't make the case overly strong for long term. But it is of moderate significance if you're doing software that the courts are favorable. If you can provide a reasonable argument as to why something's in or out, um, the courts will generally side with the taxpayer. Okay. So they talked about things like CPU limitations, fault tolerances. They looked at competitive products. Um, they had uncertainties on node and master behavior, how to deal with sequences of subscriptions, and things that ch changes in one of those assumptions would affect the upstream or downstream processes. Okay. One other really interesting point on the Axis case is not only did they win on the technology side, when they went to court, they sued the Canada Revenue Agency for all of their legal fees. That normally the cost award is minimal, you know, like they don't pay your full legal fees, they pay. $80 a day or some trivial nominal amount. Um, there's a rule in the act that the judge can increase that amount okay, if he thinks the CRA's position was frivolous. And he did in this case. And there's actually a, a, an indication that with SRNDD cases, because there's a lot of them going to court, if the CRA's position is frivolous, that the awards could be substantial, including all, all of your legal fees. Okay? I've actually had other clients who settled out of court and not only got all their credits, but all, the, all their legal fees for the big downtown law firm. Sadly, I'd say that's one of the big problems. That um, I used to say, well, this is a great process we've got, that the client, if they don't get along with the CRA, they can always go to tax court, and uh, we'll have some really good precedents. And a year or two ago, I was telling everyone, don't worry, by this time, we're going to have some really good precedents. And what I found is the, clients, uh, the CRA settled with those clients. They said, you know what, you were right. We were wrong. We're bad. We're going to give you all your money, plus interest, plus we'll even pay all your legal fees. So what do you got to complain about? And the problem is the client's happy, but the problem's still here. So um, I, I don't really know. What can you, is, the, is the tax court process going to be feasible if on every strong claim that they deny, they make you wait two to three years to get there, so you lose Typically, the client doesn't continue to claim. They want to see what happens. Um, CRA tends to, the client tends to lose no matter what in, in these situations. And it's, it's brought into question uh, stuff that we'll be talking about this afternoon. Should the CRA even be administering it? There's a new political party in, and they're talking right now about moving the technology part out of the CRA and into uh, a different ministry. So Minister Baines is looking at that, and we may see something like that. We'll, we'll talk about that this afternoon.